Listen to the Gospel of our Lord found in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleaned by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I abide in you. Just as the branches cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Every branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. I have said this, these things to you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And let us pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. The reason I'm wearing my stole this day with all the different races and peoples of the earth is a reminder that we should represent all the races and nations and people of the earth. The nature of the church has always been one that struggles with who belongs and who does not belong, who is welcomed and who is rejected outright. In the, my entire life of ministry, up until quite recently, uh, homosexuality was considered for many people to be outside and for others in the church who are typical or who are gay or who love people who are gay have always wanted to include them into the family of God the arguments over whether clergy should be homosexual whether elders or deacons uh, should be allowed who are different than the rest of the, us heterosexuals has been one of those fights the entire time I've been in ministry. And quite frankly, I'm tired of it. I have served with gays and lesbians as clergy, gays and lesbians as elders, gays and lesbians as deacons, my entire ministry, and at the same time for most of the congregation, were not aware that that was the reality. But that's not what I'm trying to talk about today. The reason why we are so or so many are so taken aback by, as the old 
um, psych psychiatric uh, criteria called it deviance is that it scares us quite frankly we are afraid of that which we do not understand or do not wish to understand but this problem is not a 21st century problem not even a 20th century problem but this problem goes all the way back to the first century and what I'm talking about is the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, to be a eunuch in the queen's court or to take care of the princes of the kingdom, the men were castrated. And they were castrated so that the, there would be no sexual misconduct between their keep. The Ethiopian eunuch is traveling back, going back home from Jerusalem, and he's uh, going south from Jerusalem, and he's in a chariot, which means a two-wheeled wagon, but he clearly has a driver because he is apparently sitting down in that chariot reading a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now, before we get too far down the Ethiopian eunuch thing, this man is wealthier than any man Philip has ever known. Scrolls, are not owned by individuals. Scrolls are owned by the community of faith, by the synagogue or the temple. They're not individually read, but they were meant to be read in worship. But here this wealthy man in a chariot with driver as he travels the length of a thousand miles or more is reading out loud because you read out loud in the ancient world uh, reading out loud from the scroll of Isaiah this is extremely wealthy to the extreme poor. And when he is baptized, he probably is the wealthiest man the church has had so far. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So he's writing down and he's reading and Philip is taken up by the Spirit and hears him reading and runs along the side of the chariot and says, do you understand what you are reading? And the wealthy man says, how do I understand without anyone to teach me? Again, the role of scripture was always read in worship, and whether you're talking about the Jewish synagogue or the Christian church, it was read, and then the rabbi or the preacher proclaimed what it meant. How can I do this privately? Scripture was never meant to be interpreted and read in private. So much so that the first time in our English history that there was a Bible in every sanctuary in England was under Henry VIII, and that Bible was called the Big Bible because it was huge. And it, no, it had a chain on it where it was chained to the table or the floor 
so it would not be stolen. Henry VIII was the first one person to be put, put a Bible in every church in England. So that's roughly a little under 500 years ago. And before that, many churches didn't have scriptures at all. And the preacher would preach from memory the stories of scripture. Or would have a very limited copy of scripture, pages, that they would teach from. That's with the printing press, again, a little over 500 years ago, with movable type, that we would have individuals owning books. It is said that Louis XIV, the king of France, who was considered the wealthiest man in Europe, and possibly the world at his time, had a library. How many books were in his library? Or how many books are in your library? I would have to say over a thousand, at least. His library consisted of two books, the Bible and Machiavellian, the Prince yin and yang, so to speak. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the idea that Philip would see some man reading the prophet Isaiah going down a road in a chariot never in his wildest dreams did he think, even put the reading of scripture and the riding of the chariot together. I can remember the first time I saw a phone in a car. So the struggle between rich and poor is here. But the Ethiopian eunuch did a pilgrimage from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to be by the temple. And he had somewhere, uh, somehow, purchased a scroll. If you've ever gone to the synagogue and had a tour of the synagogue, every synagogue has scrolls in their um, sanctuary that are locked up in the sanctuary, taken out for, for worship and special occasions. And they will tell you who wrote the manuscript of that scroll and what church would... Um, or excuse me, what synagogue that scroll came from. In the uh, Baton Rouge synagogue that I was aware of or had frequently, my mother was the musician at the synagogue as well, uh, they would tell you this one came from Czechoslovakia, smuggled out before the Nazis got it and that community is no more. They, it, it's almost that each had a name. And you would never touch a scroll. You used a pointer, and they have a special word for it, because even the ha your oils on your hands meant, meant that those scrolls deteriorated quicker. So again, Any pious Jew would never imagine seeing somebody riding down the road reading a scroll on a chariot as it bumps along. It's just impossible to imagine that. Well, anyway, here are the sacred words 
are set out in the middle of nowhere And so the poor disciple climbs up into the chariot. I mean, it might have been a tight fit. All right, couldn't have been bigger. And explains to them, the eunuch, about who the suffering servant is and that it is Jesus and tells them the story of salvation. As the, the chariot keeps going along, and they come up to a stream, and notice who asks, what is preventing me from being baptized? The eunuch is asking this question. Now, when he was in Jerusalem, He could not have gone into the temple. He could not have gone into the synagogues because he was seen as sexually unclean. The worst thing for first century Jews to think about was a man who chose to be castrated and it was just horrifying to him. He was totally out of reach, out of the kingdom, no longer a part of anyone who is beloved by God. The word, what hinders me or prevents me or restricts me or denies me the right to be baptized. Now, Philip couldn't figure out what hindered him and baptized. And again, if you, I had uh, written a subtitle for the book of Acts, what I would say is it's the Acts of the Apostles or Don't blame me, blame God. He tells this story a couple times in Acts, and every time the church goes out in Acts, they keep bumping into new cultures and peoples and situations that they did not plan upon. The first disciples are Galileans, then they had Judeans, Then they had Samaritans. Now they have an Ethiopian. This crosses racial lines. This crosses sexual lines. This crosses all the taboos you could think of. What is to prevent me to being baptized? In the first century church, to call each other brother and sister in Christ, brother and sisters of every race and nation, was bewildering for those who were not a part of the church in the first century. Because the term brother and sister literally meant your biological brother, your biological sister, those who belong to your biological family. Yes, and there's a little bit of adoption going on that would include them too, but for the most part, it's that small nucleus of people that are mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, grandparents. But in the first century church, brothers and sisters would greet each other with a holy kiss, share a meal together, and not only just symbolically as communion, but broke bread and ate and shared each other's food. 
and sat at each other's table and declared to the world that they were the family of God. And what also offended the world of the first century is who are some of the family members? People that would not be considered acceptable in the synagogue or the temple, but found their place in this hodgepodge group of slave and free, male and female, Jew or Greek. And so, uh, the church, the Orthodox Church of Ethiopia claims to be a church from the first century and claims this eunuch and claims Simon of Cyrene to be their founding fathers of faith. They go, went on and proclaimed the message of Jesus. That church was never a part of the Roman Empire church, which the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics and we, the descendants of the Latin church, come from. They do not have our Apostles' Creed. They do not cite the Nicene Creed, even though they know of the Nicene Creed. Their church is different, but all oh so faithful. They, by the way, are the most Jewish of the Christian churches that have survived in this world. They celebrate both the Sabbath and the Lord's Day, and they are kosher as well. Who is acceptable in the church? Who do we bar our doors from? Oh, I long for that day that we do not bar anybody, but all are welcomed in the waters of baptism to receive the forgiveness of us and of God and to share in the sacred table as a brother and sister of ours. Who is acceptable? Everyone who hopes in him is welcomed. Amen. Let us say the words of the Apostles' Creed. And the way I have it printed in the bulletin is the way it would be used in baptism because of this baptism we've just been preaching about. And it's a question and answer response. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. And on the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven, where he, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.